in, in terms of uh, Anglo means for UK and uh, American is obviously for US. So in modern times, in the 21st century, the impact of their policies, what they demand, uh, you know, from and what they expect, how the world or what should be published according to their own terms and criteria, because this is a kind of a new colonialism in which even the publishing houses, in terms of publishing houses in the West, in particular in UK and USA, they are kind of looking and looking up in terms of, you know, publishing or translating books coming from the third world countries, from, from the other countries of the world, um, you know, from other languages, even South America, Spanish languages, or say from a subcontinent, you know, texts written in Urdu, in where Pakistani writers are concerned, and Hindi in concern in terms of Indian writers and other parts of the world. So the whole debate was in terms of what Vinuti talks about is that if they're accepted for publication in, in, in a presses in Europe, in Europe in particular, America or UK, then what sort of, you know, uh, should I say restrictions are there and what sort of expectations are there from them, how to conduct, how to, um, to carry on with that. So we are going to take forward what uh, uh, Vinuti talked about and his two important concepts of, um, you know, discussion uh, in terms of domestication and foreignization. I'll go back to those concepts again, uh, but let me first finish, finish with what I have to do today. So this is discussion of Vinuti's work. This is in terms of a kind of a, a discussion or an analysis of what was his contribution or in terms of how other people's, how other critics look at Vinuti's contribution in particular, okay? So, the discussion is the general, what I will explain again in simple words is that Vinuti's analysis of the Anglo-American, Anglo-American, as I said, Anglo means UK, England, America, America, okay? So the analysis of the Anglo-American publishing hegemony seems to tie in with the power relations of the post-colonial world. So the very analysis shows that if, if according to Venuti, as, an, as a cultural theorist, he found out that this hegemony, by hegemony means that somehow, because of their power, they are still able to control, hold control, you know, um, uh, in terms of uh, what to be published and, and in how to be published and what to be translated and how to be translated and so on. So they do keep a very tight control. This is a hegemonic. The word hegemony means to control. So it's like a power relation in which these countries, Western powers, still assert their power relations on the post-colonial world, formerly, you know, countries which were colonized and other parts of the world, I should say third world countries. In terms of whatever creative writings are coming from this part of the world, the third world countries and from the former colonial and, you know, countries who were colonized, Somehow, whatever even the creative mind, whatever they are writing, even on their writings, when they have to be translated, say in England or America, still this hegemony, this restriction, this binding is, is what is overbearing presence of these two powers is there, which keeps a check on them. This kind of check or hegemonic relationship still exists, okay? So this is in terms of the historical background, the social background in the current uh, 21st century, and what's happening and even the last two decades of 20th century. So Venuti's analysis of the Anglo-American publishing hegemony seems to tie in with the power relations of the post-colonial world. According to him, the percentages of translations published in the UK and the USA seems to be low. So, um, you know, uh, according uh, to the research is done, he says, uh, and if we were to talk in terms of percentage that to, to I mean, how many in terms of figures and, and if we were to quantify and find out that in terms of translation, uh, how much percentage of work in, is, you know, is, is permissible in, uh, in, uh, in the media or in the publishing houses in UK and USA. And overall analysis shows that it is some seems to be very low. How? It's around like 2.5% or 3% of the total. So you can see it's a very low percent in terms of the entire books, total books, which are published in the entire, in the publishing eminent and prominent publishing houses in USA and in UK, just around about 2.5% or 3% of the books are actually, you could categorize them in terms of 
translation in terms of books which are first translated and then published in these two countries. So Benuti asserts that for many authors writing in other languages, the benchmark of success is to be translated into English. But the publishers in the UK and USA tend to choose works that are easily accessible or assimilated into the target culture. So he says that most of the creative writers belong to the third world countries or other countries even from South America, um, you know, uh, for them, when they are writing in their native languages, for in, writers in South America, say in Spanish language and other writers from the former colonies, like, in, you know, as I give the example in South Asia, they are all writing in, in their own native languages. And for them, it's a dream or it's a kind of a, a benchmark, a standard of success for them. It's a goal. It's a well, it's a cherished goal for them that if their books are published or translated into English. So if for all their efforts, for all the creative genius, for all the creative work, for them, they are still dependent upon the West too, and they're looking forward towards Anglo-American publishing houses in terms of accepting their works to be translated and uh, to be translated into English and then published there. But somehow it is seen that the publishers in the UK and USA, they still tend to choose as somebody wants to join to choose works that are easily assimilated into the target. But the, what actually happens is in terms of US, US and UK, still what they're looking for is that they still find and they are uh, you know, willing to, to translate and publish those books where they feel that whatever is reflected in terms of culture, culture as it's reflected in the source text, they feel that it can be easily assimilated into the target culture. For them, everything is, as I discussed in the last class as well, that how if its translation is to be done in terms of, <coughs> excuse me, then it has to be seen that it, it is uh, the source text uh, target culture uh, uh, has to be somehow, it should be able to easily merge and translate it into the target culture, kind of bringing it close. In simple words, to translate, to transform the source culture of, uh, of the source textbooks when they're translated into English to be to assimilate in the target culture, that is the culture of, of um, in terms of America and, and, U, and UK and to assimilate. And then probably that will be the first stage of acceptance. That will be the first stage of acceptance in the publishing houses in, um, in the, Ameri uh, in the Anglo-American, uh, you know, uh, in a, a circle. Okay. Uh, then, um, Benuti also sees this imbalance as yet another example of cultural hegemony of the Anglo-American publishing and culture, which is very insular and refuses to accept the foreign, yet is happy for its own works to maintain a strong hold in other countries. Now, if we look at critically and examine that Benuti is right in when he asserts he said that this is, this is a kind of imbalance which is there at the top. If you look at this, that if you look at the policies of these, uh, you know, somebody wants to join, if you look at the cultural hegemony in terms of how Anglo-American uh, publishing houses are keeping a control uh, on, uh, should I say, uh, the countries of the former colonies, and they are, uh, their reason is, or their rationale is, that they, uh, they personally feel that whatever... Uh, the only those source texts uh, they feel they would give uh, permission to be translated into English and published in Anglo-American publishing houses is where they feel that you know the culture you know they are kind of not willing to expose the readers in America or in England sorry uh, in terms of uh, you know in terms of talking about that uh, a, a text which is coming from a country which has a very different cultural background so it's not in terms of controlling a check and balance on what types of books are published. They would also like to look at the culture, the background, from where these books are emanating, from where they're in the publishing. So this is like the, uh, you know, the minute to see that they want to like to insulate. They want to keep their public, the reading public, like far away from the realities of the world, what is happening in the other parts of the world, the third world countries, and they kind of refuse to accept anything foreign by foreign obviously means the third foreign here is in terms of like uh, say pakistani text or indian text uh, 
or I just give the examples of South American text. For them, it's very difficult for them. They almost refuse to accept foreign text. And they would they it's, they would not it would they would not be happy for its own work to maintain a strong hold in other countries. So I think this is again a way of hegemony, a cultural. It's not only a hegemony in terms of monitoring the publishing and controlling the publishing agency. I personally feel this is like they're monitoring the minds of the people. You see, this is what like a kind of a, a checking on like a kind of a, I should say looking at in terms of controlling the mindset the way of ideas because if you give a free hand to the american anglo-american publishers that they would publish country books coming up from any part of the world which would be like these people would be bringing their own aspect of cultural obviously it would be something the world would be very rich in terms of depiction of bringing forth culture of distinct countries very far away countries far away lands with their own um, culture and language as well. But no, what USA wants and UK wants is they want to insulate them, they want to you know, protect them, they refuse to accept anything foreign coming, even if it is in the terms of culture depicted in textbooks or in books or stories or novels, they're not happy with it. And they basically, they kind of feel threatened. I personally feel they feel threatened and they feel that if this would be like you know, they still want to maintain a strong hold on other countries. For them, this is their way of keeping a check, keeping a control on what is happening in other parts of the world in terms of, you know, controlling them. So this way, in this way, USA and UK would not like to give a free hand and would not allow a foreign text to be published, to be translated into English and published in the Anglo-American publishing houses. So I hope so far it's clear to you so this is the overall background in terms of what was happening and why Venuti came up with these two strategies of domestication and foreignization. So um, somebody wants to join. So Venuti expresses this in damning terms in his book, Free Thinking Translation Discourse, uh, Subjectivity, Ideology in the following uh, in the following words. Okay, Rubina has just joined and Fez uh, Sadiq. Uh, okay, so I'm admitting you, Rubina, and Fez Sadiq have to mark your attendance. Okay. Okay, um, so Rubina and Fez Sadiq, I, I just need to mark your attendance. Just wait, wait for the class for a moment. Okay, fine, that's okay. Rubina and Fez Sadiq. Okay, so when Venuti expresses this, he's very, uh, you know, critical of the stance of the Anglo-Americans and Fez Sadiq and Rubina. So he says he expresses this in, in quite damning terms in his particular book, Rethinking Translation, Discourse, Subjectivity, Ideology. And he comes up his own critique and he says, and I'll quote in the following words, Anglo-American publishing has been instrumental in producing readers who are aggressively monolingual and culturally Pakyoku, while reaping the economic benefits of successfully imposing Anglo-American cultural values on a sizable foreign readership. Okay, so um, in terms of this, uh, you know, Venuti uh, thinks about this in this in these terms, and in particular, uh, uh, you know, he talks about in this in this book of his, which is discourse, subjectivity, ideology, and all. He said that somehow these Anglo-American publishing houses, they are in fact instrumental and they are in fact, they are the ones who are producing the readers, uh, you know, who are aggressively. So as this particular strategy, this policy, which I talked about, that they try to insulate their public from anything foreign, which a different culture in a different language, uh, you know, they are not ready uh, to, you know, ex to allow the opportunity for their readers in in America or England to be exposed, you know, to, to come to know what is happening in other parts of the world, even just through creative writings published in that part of the world. So as a result, um, as uh, you know, Venuti expresses his, his, his disgust and his critique, and he says this American, Anglo-American publishing houses, what they are doing is, they are the ones who are actually responsible, they are instrumental, and they are producing these readers upon readers who are basically monolinguals by monolinguals what do you mean because if there's in america 
it is a monolingual society because for them everybody speaks and reads and you know in english language that is the mother tongue and this official language same is the case with you you are uk as well for them english is everything it's not a bilingual society same with you as it's a monolingual society it's english is their you know should i say the mother tongue or the source or the target or the academic language or the standard language or the official language english is everything for them okay so as a result of this policy um, you know when you feel that they, they are turning the public into be just to not only monolingual they're just confiding and just using english language also but they are also making them culturally pakyoko now culturally pakyoko this term means that they are they are exposing their public to a very very limited and narrow minded point of views because if you do not make your readers read about what's happening in the east or west or the north pole or the south pole or the or in other countries in the east in asia what's happening it's like you're making your public very narrow minded in terms of a unki limited sa knowledge hoga they are limited to whatever they can see around look around in their own country aur usme bahut se narrow minded or interest of point of view they would just be looking at themselves uh, not anything beyond their own knows that what's happening in other parts of the world or what is happening to that okay so according to their uh, to from the people in anglo american publishing in, in industry who are responsible for this situation for instrumental in producing readers who are just monolingual and culturally also very very narrow minded and you know should should i say limited with a limited vision so actually in this way they are reaping the economic benefits of successfully imposing anglo american cultural values on a sizable foreign readership so in a way what they are doing is, is with this policy uh, you know they are not only reaping this benefit ke apni hi kitabon ko publish kare and they are reaping this economic benefits because readers are everywhere in every part of the world so if you are uh, in terms of publishing the and you know day in and day out these books written in in, in england and america and published in english language so you are in a way um, imposing your own values the anglo american culture and values on a very very large sizable foreign reader foreign reader means ye kitabein jo anglo england ya america mein publish ho rahi hain they reach in every part of the world so that's why this is one of one way of imposing your own values your own culture and language on the foreign readership in whatever part of the world these readers are mind you in asia or europe or in you know in south america or middle east or wherever there is all educated people who can read and write in english you are kind of imposing these anglo american policies ke uh, the books which are published according to their policy you are you know imposing them on these uh, these readers in different parts of the world and as uh, and your uh, yourself your industry your publishing industry is also capitalizing on that okay mind it because it's all a game of finance it's a game it's in terms of a, this market this publishing industry it's a rich industry it implies a lot of economic benefits so if you are reaping all the benefits yourself ke apne hi writers ko promote kar rahe hain who are writing in english to translation ko ab minimize kar rahe hain and these writers who are writing in america they are already you know Expo, you know, intent of promoting American culture, unique values, unique language. So, in a way, you are trying to control the minds of the people outside the Anglo-American, you know, this area. And in other words, in, in economic terms as well, you are reaping the economic benefits. Okay. Uh, now, let me narrate you one example here. Uh, this is, you know. Um, I lived in U.S. for two years uh, while my husband was doing his um, MPhil in engineering, MS in engineering. So uh, at that time, um, I observed through meeting American friends, although I was not working at that time. But even by discussion, you could see the most of the American people who were university graduates, that is, they had not much knowledge of what you know what was happening in other parts of the world. I'm talking about this. average educated americans university graduates okay maybe doing ms or masters level 
I'm not talking about university academia in terms of professors who are PhDs and all that. I'm talking about average Americans, engineering graduates, who would like to do their bachelor's in engineering and enter the job market or even doing their MA. But they were all had a very, very narrow, uh, you know, aspect about life. Everything for them was about America. And talking about what to talk about Pakistan, when I talked about, you know, naturally, uh, you know, when you meet people, you introduce about yourself, about your country, about this, and everybody, when if you have the opportunity, you go abroad, then you become all the more patriotic, and you all, we all, obviously, your relatives who live abroad, you know, they are all very, very nationalist, and they become, want to take pride of their culture, their language, and everything. And then you talk about that home, sweet home, in your own country where you are there, you miss them, you will miss your cultural roots and everything. So I felt that it's very amazing that they are not much aware. They are uh, university graduates, they're studying here. And one of them, you know, uh, another friend of all the, uh, you know, talking about people even from South America. South America is their immediate neighbor, Mexico and Brazil, and, we, and, and you know, all these, uh, Argentina, these are all, you know, their own neighboring Venezuela, because we had some friends from Venezuela, these foreigners coming from different parts of the world, who were studying there in that university from South America, Venezuela, from, you know, from Brazil, from Argentina, from Mexico, and then from the Middle East, Arab, from, you know, from even from this part of the Arab world, like from Pakistan and India and Bangladeshi students, and far away, including Chinese and Malaysians and Indonesians. So, you know, just, you could see that almost the whole world was there. So, what I personally would like at that, at that time, let's see that we, at our students, when they graduate, you know, so from masters, you know, even bachelor's students, may like, I'm sure you know a lot about the geography of the world and you know about the different nations and whatever their culture is. We are, our students are much way, better, well aware of what is happening around in the world and what it's all. And I look at, look at these average, somebody wants to join, these average Americans, uh, you know, they are not much. Now we understand it's because of this policy, this, this and policy makers at the top, these Anglo-American publishing houses and all these on the top of the policy makers, they would like the people to be monolingual, to be cultural prakiyokos, in terms of a very limited, narrow exposure. Unka interest was apnehi mulk, apnehi chizon se hai. And as a word, even the cultural values, the readership, that is limited to their own immediate, uh, you know, country where they belong. Okay. So uh, this example, which I've just quoted from real life, is just to explain to you the concept that this is what is happening there. Okay. So in a way, I, at least we feel that although we live in this third world countries, in this part of the world, our people are better aware of what's happening in the world. We are more open to change. We are more open to look at the culture, of what is happening. And our students, when they study, say English literature or American literature, or isi tarah jab aap nene disciplines padte like these translation studies, your all my your minds are open to learn about what's happening. You tend to learn and you try to absorb from that. Okay. So uh, uh, what it it meant was uh, by explaining this example is that this was a policy uh, on the top, uh, on the part of the policy makers who are controlling them, and as America in itself. What to talk about other issues, even in these publishing houses and the publishing, uh, you know, policies as well, they are keeping a tight, strong hold on the countries of the rest of the world in terms of anything which has to be published or accepted in USA or in UK, it has to confine, it has to confide, it has to be acceptable in their according to their, uh, uh, you know, acceptance, according to their criteria, should I say, and in and which would, in a way, even the text from wherever they come, they would be instrumental in, in you know, imposing or, you know, kind of reflecting this Anglo-American Anglo cultural values, okay? So, hence, uh, market forces reinforce and even determine these trends. So, these trends which I've explained to it, that this overall uh, scenario it has a direct impact upon that how the market trends, how market trends we're talking in terms of publishing, translation, it all has a direct impact upon them, okay? 
So uh, now we move to the key summary for what this term invisibility was for Venuti. And what did he talk about? And what he talked about these two terms, domestication and colonization, and why they were important for him. So this is like a, a main summary of what this entire topic was it. But I have, after I've read this uh, summary, I'm just going to read a page or so from my, from my textbook in order to explain to you uh, this concept. So the key term for Vinuti is uh, invisibility. I'm sure uh, this is a misprint here. This word is, is missing here. The key term for Vinuti is invisibility. This refers to how in Anglo-American culture, the foreign is made invisible both by publishing strategies and the preference for the fluent architect. So this whole thing, when we talk about invisible, remember we talked in the last lecture that the role of the Aapti chapter ki to heading we gave him, Jyotha Vinuti and the invisibility of the translate, translator. Uh, that is, this is what the West expects. The Anglo-Americans, the, the expectation had that the translator should, should not be, you know, in terms of invisible, should not show his presence in terms of his likes or his dislikes or his preferences or how uh, kind of given this free hand to conduct the translation the way he or she wants to do. So this term invisibility refers to how in Anglo-American cultures the foreign is made invisible both by publishing strategies and the preference. So anything foreign, by foreign means the foreign element in the books which have come from foreign lands to be translated into English. So this foreign means, as I gave the example, Pakistani text, Indian text, Mexican text, South American. Wo books jab jati hain to be published, to be translated in, in USA. They feel that the, the role of the publisher or the translator should, be, should not be clear, should not be visible, both at the publishing strategies when they will be published, but also, you know, when it's before that, when it's being translated into a very, very fluent target text that erases traces of foreign. So the translator's job um, here is what they're dictating the translator is. It's kind of dictating the translator the do's and don'ts, how you're going to translate, what is on, what is not on, what is to be expected from you. And, the, and it says that it is, they know that uh, these publishing strategies, the translator has to follow that for his survival in this market, Anglo-American publishing agency may have been survivor ke liye. The poor translator has to follow the dictates of the publishing agencies, publishing strategies, and he has to cater to the needs that whatever he translates, it should be very, very fluent in target text, very close to the target culture, and it should erase all traces of the foreign culture from where that actual source text emanated. Source text, jahan se bhi aai, jis country se bhi aai, uske traces aapne erase karne hai. As a good translator, uh, in, and to when it's, so that your text is acceptable for a fluent target text. Vinuti discusses two strategies. They are domesticating and foreignization. So that's why Vinuti talks about these two strategies in this whole scenario. How to cater, kaise is scenario ko, background I have explained to you in detail how to cope with this strategy in terms of either to have the policy of domesticating or the other is foreignization. You know the difference between domesticating is what it's like is agreeing to the terms and conditions of the American Anglo-American culture, the publishing agency in terms of translating, make the public make the translator invisible and, and the preference for a very fluent target text and erasing all the signs, signs, traces of foreign in it, that will be like domesticating. And the other is foreignization, which according to Vinuti is when the writer has, or the translator has the liberty in terms of retaining some elements of that, you know, a translation in which, we, which they would not be under the influence of excluding all dominant cultural values of the source text, but it could leave a yeah, kind of the, uh, the, the foreignization, uh, this method would kind of offer a resistance to the dominant. So he favors the later. Vinuti himself basically favors the second strategy, which is foreignizing. Because he favors the later in a policy of resistance to the dominant, because he personally feels that the translator should assert, 
his right in terms of offering resistance to the dominant ethnocentric violence that means anything ethnocentric that means in terms of this value of ethno of this anglo-american publishing that they have to assert they have to prove that everything they have themselves they belong to a superior race they are superior to others they have a superior culture or they belong to a superior race this aspect of ethno ethnocentric cheese usme se usko he feel you, the, the translators should offer resistance to this urge you are not going to agree to everything dominant ethnocentric violent values in which which would trace which erase the actual cultural values of the source text so he himself was in favor of adopting the second strategy foreignization in which he favors that as a translator you should offer resistance to the dominant ethnocentric violent views which existed no matter what the publishers and literary reviewers are talking about what their criteria is what their level of acceptance is what they're ex what they're expecting from you as a translator but at least the translator should do this good job of offering this some resistance to this particular policy okay uh so i hope uh, so far uh, you know this is this background and everything is explained in very simple terms to you so that you know in which which in, in terms of uh, what venuti was trying to uh, achieve and what these of, the, of a combination of these two strategies domesticating and foreignization and the difference between these two strategies and how he was in favor of foreignization and what was the background for that okay now class i just want to take another 5 10 minutes i'm going to read out from my source text from my um, my notes uh, and then uh, i'm going to take the attendance and and then we'll wind up today's class okay so the discussion on vinith's work was basically you know in terms of people talking about in terms of there are other uh, this is as i said other critics are always there to criticize to come up with their critique whether the 100% agree with vinuti or not same it was the case with in vinuti's case as well some translators they feel that one was a very famous fem e y m he came up with a very very sarcastic stance towards vinuti and raised a number of pertinent issues the first thing he, he talks about is will translation really change if translators refuse to translate fluently as not and he notes that vinuti's call for action for translators to demand increased visibility is best qualified by vinuti himself as a translator then palm says that do you think according to the way uh, vinuti is talking and uh, is calling on uh, for action on the part of the translators to demand visibility on their part that they should be given this right when they are translating from source text into english at least they should be given this license this freedom to become visible in terms of highlighting the ish, the culture of the source text so he says this is questions otherwise and then he talks about another issue is then he says he also talks of vinuti when he is concentrating on translation into english the trend towards a translation policy of fluency or domestication the word fluency or domestication uh, kind of they equate with each other so this occurs in translation into other languages as well he cites example of brazil spain and france as example he says this is not this policy of domestication by the way is not occurring in anglo american circle only it's also happening it is not in terms of when texts are translated in into english language he says it occurs in other countries but brazil and spain and france and they are also they are talking about domesticating so irrespective of the relative so, uh, power of source and target culture so overall we see that this policy is continuing and he says that if um yeah, you know vinuti is very very critical about the anglo american publishing agency he should take into account that this is happening in other countries as well like brazil and spain and france as well and then he talks about uh, that if vinuti's resistance is testable then he takes about is and gives an example uh, that how vinuti himself should have followed this policy when he talks about uh, translating because as i said vinuti was not only a theorist he was a practicing translator himself okay So nevertheless, uh, nevertheless, he says that Venuti does uh, enable us to talk about translators as real people in political situations, about the quantitative as, uh, um, aspects of translation policies, and about ethical criteria that might relate translators to the societies of the future. So, in a way, uh, you know, Pen at the end he concedes that Venuti does at least gives this opportunity, gives this opportunity 
enables these translators at least to talk about translators and bringing forth the role of translators as they are real people, real people, real people in terms of political situations, about the uh, other uh, quantitative aspects of translation policies and about other ethical criteria which might relate to that in future. So it's, it's basically offering a specific methodology to apply to the analysis of translation and all that. Okay. Um, and mind you, I think there was a question from, I think whether from your section or somewhere, somebody talked about that, how do we know that this, these two terms, uh, you know, translate up uh, domestication, yeah, foreignization uh, is there in a, in a text which is translated. So I, I answered this and I'll explain again, this would only by comparing the source text and the target text linguistically. This you would be only be doing it if you're export in the source text ko bhi aapne pad sakte hain. It's, it's in a language which is your own language, maybe from Urdu text. And if it's translated into English uh, language uh, as, a, as, a, as a, what I should say, target text, then you as a neutral person can compare both the source text, target text, in terms of, and you're going to look around if there are any signs of foreignizing or domesticating. Now that you know what is foreignizing is and what is domesticating, so you can critically evaluate and see that in this textbook, mein, which is being translated from Urdu into as, as a source text into English as a target text, is this aspect of uh, you know um, foreignization, domesticating strategies are at work? Do you think the translator has been using the strategies or no? And another way would be, uh, you know, by interviewing the translators yourself and finding out their strategies, their ways of researching, what were they doing, how did they correspond with different authors? Because translators themselves, when they're translating, the best thing would be for them to correspond, get in touch with the actual writer, the authors of the source text, you know, they actual text, get in touch with the authors, the writers of the source text or the novels or the creative writing. And then you can discuss with them that what were their strategies uh, you, if you have interviewed these uh, source text writers, what were their strategies when they were writing? And then, uh, you know, you as a translator to keep in mind. So as, as I said that uh, you are now, mashallah, in a position to, to be able to compare and see for yourself that with the help of, you know, looking at these two texts, the source text and the translated version into English and looks if there are any signs of foreignizing or domestic strategy, and you can look for the examples as well, okay? So class, uh, that's all for today. If you have any questions, you're welcome. And this is till today's class, this is included in your paper, okay? So uh, Vinuti, in uh, Aaj ki lecture, you have midterm exams.